On this edition of Exposé, a reporter's hunch. It was like, oh my God, I kicked over a stone and there's something under there. Leads to a local icon. His public persona was built around the aura of being a war hero. Who turns out to be the most corrupt congressman ever caught. I'm resigning from the House of Representatives because I've compromised the trust of my constituents. Funding for Exposé has been provided by House of Representatives because I've compromised the trust of my constituents. I misled my family, friends, staff, colleagues, the public, and even myself. For all of this, I am deeply sorry. The truth is I broke the law. November 28, 2005. San Diego Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham resigns his office amid scandal. The eight-term Republican admits to taking over $2 million in bribes. In sheer dollar terms, Cunningham had become the most corrupt congressman ever caught. And he might have gotten away with it, except for the work of an enterprising Washington newsman, Marcus Stern. Being a journalist is like having a license to hunt. When I am engaged in a story and I'm trying to chase down a story and get an answer to something, I'm, nev I'm, I'm never happier than that moment. Stern's investigation into Cunningham began not with a leak or an inside tip. It began with a reporter's intuition. As news editor for the Copley News Service, Stern's job is to cover Washington for the Copley-owned San Diego Union Tribune. And when in 2005 he read a report detailing privately financed congressional travel, he became curious about two trips to Saudi Arabia taken by the popular San Diego representative, Duke Cunningham. What he said was that he was just trying to improve relations between the two countries, Saudi Arabia and the United States, and I didn't buy it. And, that, and I just had a visceral reaction to that, and I had to find out why he went. Pursuing an answer to that question would lead Mark Stern, with colleagues from the Copley News Service in Washington and the San Diego Union Tribune, into the biggest story of their lives, taking them deep inside the world of money and politics. Cunningham was not the end of the story. Cunningham was the beginning of the story, a very important, very big and dramatic beginning. Duke Cunningham was not your average congressman. As a fighter pilot in Vietnam, he shot down five enemy jets, becoming the first Navy ace of that war. He often boasted, though it was not true, that he was the model for Tom Cruise's character in the movie Top Gun. He really was viewed by many people in San Diego as larger than life. Um, he, he was Duke. He was John Wayne. And his public persona was built around the aura of being a war hero. In 1990, Cunningham parlayed that image into a seat in Congress. And two years later, after districts were redrawn, he squared off against another Republican incumbent, Bill Lowry. Congressman Lowry was vulnerable in 92 because he had bounced more than 300 checks at the House Bank. And he had ties to that era's notorious savings and loan scandal. Duke Cunningham sold himself as, as a guy who was really clean. He's going to be a congressman we can be proud of. And that was his slogan. Bill Lowry, seeing that he is about to be tarred and feathered with his own past misdeeds, decides, I don't need this. Lowry dropped out of the race, and Duke Cunningham breezed to victory. And now the former fighter ace would become known as a partisan political fighter. He was regarded on the Hill as kind of a, a bully and full of himself, full of bluster. He called Pat Schroeder, screamed at Pat Schroeder, called her a socialist and told her to sit down. He's the one who called Barney Frank a fag. Uh, he's the one who did an obscene gesture at a crowd of 
war protesters. So I think everybody kind of held their breath whenever he spoke publicly. I don't think anybody thought of Duke Cunningham as being someone who could be corrupt or corrupted. But Mark Stern still wanted an answer. Why did Duke Cunningham travel to Saudi Arabia? Stern scoured the Pentagon procurement database, corporate records, and newspaper archives, but came up empty. On the verge of giving up, he decided to do what he calls a lifestyle audit, a review of a person's finances to see if he may be living beyond his means. I went online and did a property search on real estate for Cunningham and found that he had purchased this $2.55 million house in Rancho Santa Fe. My first thought was, this guy has no business being in Rancho Santa Fe. I mean, this is the kind of neighborhood where you would find Bill Gates, but not a member of Congress married to a school administrator. So I went to look at the purchase of his previous house. It's a house in Del Mar Heights, California, and he sold that house for $1.67 million. Reviewing the sale records for the Del Mar house, Stern became suspicious. He didn't sell this Del Mar Heights house to just anybody. He sold it to something called 1523 New Hampshire Avenue, Inc. And I recognized that as possibly a Washington, D.C. address. In fact, 1523 New Hampshire Avenue was a Washington address, the corporate headquarters of a defense contractor called MZM. Stern had never heard of the company or its owner, a man named Mitchell Wade. But Cunningham was on the House Subcommittee for Defense Appropriations. Could there be a connection? On its website, Stern learned that in just two years, MZM's federal contract went from zero to worth more than $100 million. And it wasn't lost on Mark Stern that MZM's business took off right around the time of the Cunningham house sale. It was like, oh my God, I've kicked over a stone and there's something under there. And I thought, well, let me see what this defense contractor did with the house. And what he did is he put it right back on the market for roughly the same price. And it stayed on the market for eight months and then sold for $700,000 less than what the contractor had paid the congressman for. Had Stern stumbled onto something big? It looked bad that Wade appeared to have paid Cunningham far more than what the congressman's house was worth. But for that to be a story, the reporters would need to know one more thing. We needed to close the loop and find out what Cunningham had done, if anything, for Mitchell Wade. We needed to find the quid and the quo, and that is what uh, is the definition of bribery, and this was potentially a bribery case, I think we knew from the very beginning. Now, at that point, we're pretty sure we have a very good story that's going to have legs, that's going to be very, very difficult for these guys to explain, but I also realize it's very possible they might explain it. Stern requested a telephone interview with Congressman Cunningham to discuss the House deal. He shared the tape of the call with Exposé. I just got out of a meeting, Harmony said that you had called. Uh, what you got? From the beginning of the interview, I had one goal in mind, and that is to get him to tell me what role, if any, he had played in, in steering contracts to Mitchell Wade. That would be the quid pro quo, and that would be the moment where I would go sort of, yes. So, okay, the only other question then that's whether or not uh, you did anything to help uh, MZM get the, the slew of contracts that they were able to get about that time. Uh, Mark, I don't have anything to do with contracts. Um, the way, you know, it works here, I support a lot of credible defense programs. Do you know if you've supported the MZM's programs? Oh, sure. Just like I've supported Qualcomm and everything else. Qualcomm uh, tightened to... Uh, Oh, I'm trying to think, SEIC, TRW. And I'm thinking, well, those contractors haven't purchased your house at an inflated price and put hundreds of thousands of dollars into your pocket. Stern had his story. It appeared on June 12, 2005, on page A1 of the San Diego Union-Tribune. I think the reaction in San Diego by everybody, the paper, his supporters, the military community, everybody, was complete uh, shock and disbelief. I mean, he was the favorite son. He was somebody that we had endorsed from the moment he decided he wanted to get into politics. I got a number of phone calls from uh, downtown establishment types questioning whether or not 
the paper had abandoned its Republican roots. And uh, there were individuals who questioned whether we knew what we were doing. Union Tribune editor Karen Winner refused to cave into the pressure. In fact, she did the opposite. San Diego uh, uh, and, and Karen Winner immediately had as many reporters as they could possibly throw available uh, into it. So you had business reporters, you had military reporters, you had uh, city reporters, uh, federal court reporters. We held a meeting where I said, this has got to be a priority. This, this story is a, a, a big story, it's a good story, and I believe there's more to it. Karen Winner would turn out to be prophetic. There was far more to this story. As prosecutors would later reveal, Duke Cunningham's inflated home price was just the beginning. There was a string of gifts, cars, uh, meals, antiques. Mr. Wade did everything he could to keep Duke Cunningham happy. And to keep Duke Cunningham happy, you had to give him a lot of goodies. Over lunch and drinks with Mitchell Wade, Wade would later tell authorities, Cunningham went so far as to draw up what prosecutors called a bribe menu on his congressional stationery. On the left are the dollar values in millions of contracts Cunningham promised to deliver to Mitchell Wade. On the right are the amounts in thousands of bribes the congressman demanded in return. For a $16 million contract, Wade would have to give Cunningham a $140,000 boat. To get Wade his contracts, Cunningham used what in Congress are called earmarks. Earmarks are pet projects members of Congress slip into spending bills, often after they are passed. They are legal, unless, of course, the congressperson receives a bribe in exchange. And as the reporters would learn, the line between campaign contributions from special interests and outright bribery is a thin one indeed. And I think what we see with earmarking is this huge gap between the idea of Congress representing the interests of the people and in what they're doing in reality is steering hundreds of millions of dollars to very particular interests, some of which have a legitimate public value, others of which are wasteful and downright fraudulent. It's, um, I mean, just as an American, it, uh, it, um, it angers me. It embarrasses me as an American. And as a reporter, it just made me want to dig into it as deeply as we could. I'm Tom Fudge, and you're listening to These Days in San Diego. Eight days after his story first appeared in the San Diego Union Tribune, Mark Stern was invited onto a local radio talk show. Exposé was given a copy of that program. I'm Tom Fudge, and we're talking about the Duke Cunningham home sale these days in San Diego. Give us a call at 888 And I was sitting at my desk and with my headphones on and listening and taking the calls and giving, giving my best answers I could. And all of a sudden, a guy called in on a cell phone, I believe, from his car. Chris is our next caller. Chris, go ahead. Go ahead. You're on these days. Is uh, Mr. Stern there? I remember this caller because of the tone in his voice, the tension in his voice, and the fact that he was obviously doing something that he thought was taking a risk. Uh, yeah, he's still with us. Uh, he just needs to uh, dig just a little bit deeper here. Uh, he talks about peeling back the layers of the onion. Uh, he just needs to Google ADCS. You find oh. the pattern of this behavior with Mr. Cunningham. Now, this was the kind of call that you get a fair amount on talk shows, and very often you're tempted to roll your eyes and say, yeah, right, buddy. What What is ADCS? What does that stand for? He needs to Google it. <laughs> Why don't you tell us? What's AC, What's ADCS? Well, it's a company like MZN, had no defense contracts until the campaign contributions started rolling in the door. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Chris. And, and Marcus, take that. And it was that emotion in his voice that I really remember. And maybe that was the thing that Marcus really keyed in on and caused him to seek this person out. ADCS was a San Diego company, and so Stern, based in Washington, handed the lead to the Union Tribune and reporter Dean Calbreth. For Calbreth, figuring out what ADCS did was easy, 
Founded in the mid-1990s, ADCS converted old paper documents into digital ones. But what did that have to do with Duke Cunningham? To find out, Calberth would have to probe further, starting with the company's owner, a man named Brent Wilkes. Brent Wilkes was a guy who was very high profile without anybody knowing much about him. He was very active in the local Republican Party. He was very active with some local charities. And yet, there had been very few newspaper articles that even mentioned him. To unravel the Wilkes story, Calberth set out to penetrate his inner circle. One source told him that Wilkes had stayed close to old high school friends from nearby Chula Vista. So I hopped in my car, drove down to Chula Vista, about a 15-minute drive from the newspaper office to Hilltop High. And that's Brent Wilkes. I thumbed through the yearbooks from 1970, 71, and 72, trying to find the names of friends of his, people who had been on the football team with him, people who had been in social clubs with him. I took down any easily recognizable male name, anything that, that where I could Google them and try and track down their addresses, emails, telephone numbers, whatever I could do to contact them and to say, hey, did you know Brent Wilkes? Calberth's tactics paid off. He found a handful of old buddies who told the reporter that as far back as the 1980s, Wilkes bragged over poker games of being a Washington operator, of using booze, fancy meals, and women to get close to powerful congressmen. The reporters continued to trace the career of Brent Wilkes forward into the 1990s. They found a key source, a defense contractor named Barry Nelson. The year was 1992. Nelson was running a small document conversion company and was having trouble getting paper documents released from the Pentagon. Well, our problem was pretty obvious. I mean, we needed a bigger brother. To solve his problem, Nelson was told to get in touch with Brent Wilkes. Brent Wilkes said if, if we would hire him as a consultant, he would turn to the political machine in Washington, D.C. to try to get us a bigger brother to see if he couldn't get us some help. And that's when we met um, uh, Congressman Lowry. Congressman Bill Lowry, the same Congressman Lowry that just months earlier in 1992, you'll recall, had withdrawn from the race against Duke Cunningham in his bid for re-election. When Barry Nelson met him, Lowry still had to serve out the remaining months of his congressional term. But he would soon embark on a new career as a well-connected Washington lobbyist. Brent, Brent Wilkes said if we wanted to get the attention of congressmen and senators, you know, the, there were contributions involved to meet for lunch or to meet with breakfast or whatever it might be, that that's how these people, how you got airtime directly with the congressman or the senator. So I didn't disagree with that. I mean, as a big boy, you figure out that's how that works. What ended up happening was my employees ended up writing checks. We put them in an envelope, and either Brent or Congressman Lowry, after he got out of Congress, would end up delivering an envelope to somebody. By now, the reporters were deep into the pervasive use of congressional earmarks to repay political debts. They realized that Duke Cunningham had been just the crooked tip of the iceberg. Over the course of the next six months, Calberth and Kammer sifted through thousands of pages of campaign finance disclosure forms, lobbying disclosure forms, and appropriations bills, tracking who Wilkes was donating money to, and what contracts ADCS and his other firms were receiving from the government. It was the way you feel when you're, when you're head over heels in love. You just think about the girl, you just want to be with the girl, and it consumes your every waking thought, and you dream about it. You couldn't go to bed at night because you knew that there was something that you had missed. You knew that there was some political contribution that you had missed, some lobbying record, some earmark that was out there. You feel driven to understand what's going on here. How are they using this power? What are the connections? After my wife fell asleep, after I put the kids to bed, I would go to the computer, start working working at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, keep working until 2 or 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. Uh, and Jerry uh, in Washington, D.C., he might get up at 3 or 4 in the morning and, and start emailing me, you know, which would be midnight, 1 o'clock my time. According to Dean Calbreth, between 1995 and 2005, 
Wilkes and those close to him gave at least $700,000 in political donations to Duke Cunningham and other powerful legislators. We collected the donations that had been given to legislators by the employees of ABCS, Brent Wilkes, his wife, his brothers, his nephews, his nieces. He was giving money to everyone across the board. Brent Wilkes learned how the game works in Washington, and he became a very energetic and aggressive practitioner of the game of getting the attention of members of Congress by giving them money. But prosecutors would later prove that Wilkes broke the rules of that game, that beyond his campaign contributions, he gave over $600,000 worth of bribes to Duke Cunningham. The reporters learned that as Wilkes was busy giving money to politicians, he was getting government contracts, more than $80 million worth over an eight-year period. Nearly all of them were the product of congressional earmarks. Earmarks, the reporters learned, that were often pushed on reluctant federal agencies. Cunningham and a couple of other congressmen who had also benefited from Brent Wilkes' contributions were pushing uh, the Pentagon to buy material that they really didn't want, material that ended up in warehouses, material uh, some of which was never used. The investigation into Wilkes and ADCS led the reporters to the company's Washington lobbyist, that former congressman, Bill Lowry. They found that Lowry was a master at getting earmarks for his clients, not only from Duke Cunningham, but also from another Southern California Republican congressman, Jerry Lewis. As chairman of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, Lewis was well-placed to approve hundreds of millions of dollars in federal projects for Lowry's clients, a list that included Brent Wilkes. Meanwhile, the reporters identified Lowry, the partners at his firm, and their clients as the top donors to Lewis's political action committee. As we wrote, it really seemed that the office of each was an extension of the other. I mean, it was difficult to see where Lewis ended and Lowry began. It's a fine line between a campaign contribution and a bribe, but it's that fine line that keeps you out of jail. The Justice Department is investigating the ties between Lewis and Lowry. It's a probe reportedly prompted by the Duke Cunningham corruption case. Neither Lewis nor Lowry has been charged with a crime. Jerry Lewis, who denies wrongdoing, remains the top Republican on the House Appropriations Committee. He continues to sponsor earmarks that benefit clients of Bill Lowry. Instead of government of the people, by the people, for the people, too often it seems we have government of the lobbyist, by the earmarks, for the campaign cash. That's not what Mr. Lincoln and our founding fathers had in mind. It's a real cheapening and a real subversion, it seems to me, of what we hold up as our ideal. Randall Duke Cunningham, the former Navy fighter ace, the former U.S. congressman, is serving an eight-year, four-month sentence in federal prison. He pleaded guilty to charges including bribery of a public official and accepting bribes. For all of this, I am deeply sorry. The truth is I broke the law, concealed my conduct, and disgraced my office. I know that I will forfeit my freedom, my reputation, my worldly possessions, most importantly, the trust of my friends and family. This man was a war hero. There's nothing gleeful in seeing a member of Congress so corrupt that it undercuts even more uh, the public belief in, uh, in, in the government. Where is the line that people cross? I think, you know, Congress has been debating it, but you're talking about the people that, who need the money debating whether they should stop taking political contributions. I don't see how that'll ever get resolved. The, the public trusts that, they're, that their politicians are going to represent them properly. And when that doesn't happen, somebody's got to be able to tell that story. And without journalists to do that, it's not going to happen. I live on a houseboat in Washington, and every now and then I take this boat out and we drive it up past the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Monument. And it's hard to look at those for me now and not 
reflect on this story and not think to myself that this really is not about one man's sordid misadventures. This is a far more important story. This is about the need to be vigilant uh, in protecting our government, protecting our country. Expose has been provided by 